After that, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. Then to the conference. Start. You can start. Oh, good. Uh, well, hello, everyone. I'm uh, George Isaac. I'm a senior scientist with the Cloud Physics and Severe Weather Research section of Environment Canada. And see, my my opening slide is all screwed up, but uh, anyway, bear with me. Um, there are a lot of people that have contributed to this talk. Um, I put them down as contributors rather than authors because they haven't seen the talk. So, uh, and you can see their names listed here. All of them are is in the same section that uh, um, I'm in. Okay, so how do I get to the next slide? There we go. Um, this study is funded from a wide variety of sources, including Transport Canada, Search and Rescue New Initiatives Fund in Canada, and of course Environment Canada. And I want to especially thank my colleagues that uh, are Numerical Weather Prediction Centers in Montreal, and of course uh, my um, uh, aviation colleagues at uh, both in the east and west, and Bill Burroughs, who's done a lot of work uh, that's helpful in this work, and he's also in our section. This started off as the Canadian Airport Now Casting Project, and it was basically to produce short-term forecasts, zero to six hours, or now casting of airport severe weather, um, and I'm going to show you some of the products that we've developed and um, tested at both uh, Toronto and Vancouver International Airports. The project has evolved from that into longer time periods, etc., but I'm going to describe that as we go through the talk. The CAN hour, the Canadian Airport Now Casting Forecast System, uh, has described in this paper, which is available online now. And go to it, but it basically injects all the surface measurements, the radar data, the uh, we had on-site remote sensors, the NWP model data, satellite data, lightning data, aircraft data, um, climatology data, and terminal area forecasts. Run scientific algorithms, which predict things like visibility, runway, visual range, ceiling, gust, precipitation, wind shear, turbulence, crosswinds. Airport rate, cat level, etc. And we'll uh, introduce some now casting methods which we'll describe later on. And we output this onto a, um, a website, and I'm going to describe that as well a bit later on. Algorithm development um, in terms of visibility and fog. Um, I might say that visibility uh, restrictions are due to fog and also snow and also rain. So we've got algorithms for both of those. We're also uh, calculating runway visual range. Runway visual range and visibility are both the same in daytime conditions. At nighttime, uh, they're different. And need the runway visual range in order to get cat level. So of course, in our winter situations, that's very important. We're calculating ceiling from the model uh, using both cloud fraction and or a um, um, dense uh, water uh, threshold. Uh, not doing much in blowing snow. We're calculating turbulence, wind uh, gusts. We're doing icing, precipitation type, precipitation intensity. We're doing a lightning forecast, and we're doing some real-time verification. This is the we have. This is Toronto National Airport. Uh, we have a MET compound here, the blue are the runways at the airport, and close to the existing um, MET compound at the airport. We have one instrument basis with power and data feeds, and we've got a wide variety of instruments with data feeds, uh, including, um, you know, the standard stuff like uh, winds and uh, temperature, pressure, uh, and relative to the um, cameras and so forth. We also have cylinder of um, visibility meters and many different uh, precipitation gauges. 
more interesting stuff are we have a microwave uh, filing radiometer, um, and we have vertically pointed radar, which I'll text from, and um, we're soon to get a boundary layer wind profiler, an acoustic wind profiler. Um, and we have plans for a Doppler LiDAR to give us winds at the site. This shows you our site at Vancouver International Airport, which is a twin for this study. I'm not going to talk much about it. And that the, the instruments are far basic in Vancouver. So we have a um, um, suite of airports we're looking at. This is Vancouver and all its alternates. And we also have to and its alternates. And I'm going to discuss this chart more than um, than the uh, West chart today. For each part, we produce a situation chart um, that has the various variables that ten forecast for ten variables, uh, ten minute intervals out to two hours, and hourly thereafter out to six hours. So we're predicting winds, uh, the various runways, um, visibility, ceiling. Shear influence, precipitation, thunderstorms and lightning, icing, um, airport arrival rate, which is based on weather only, the cat level, and the runway conditions. We also have um, uh, a TAP plus, just by the aviation weather centers. And we have on site camera, and we have, we're also producing forecasts for the uh, uh, bed posts. I'll show you some real time stuff later on. The threshold are where all the things, the color change are indicated here for crosswinds and ability, seal, shear, and turbulence, precipitation, thunderstorms, and lightning. For example, it goes red when there's a lightning within six statute miles of the airport. And, um, this is what we need runway visual range for. Cat level without that, and um, we're predicting runway condition and, and weather only airport arrival rate. So, oh, yeah, I wanted to just show this. This is our lightning map. Um, Bill produces this from the lightning arrays that are out there, uh, and then he forecasts where the lightning is going to go. So this, this uh, based on um, uh, NUP information. Uh, the red line here indicates where that lightning is projected to go in the next two hours. So at the site we have a vertically pointing radar, and I like this one because it shows you a freezing rain case. You can see the ruck sounding here. Uh, so the, um, this is the band, the first bright band, and then um, actually it ends up at the ground at freezing rain. This is activity, this is the Doppler velocity, and you can see as it goes from snow to rain, the uh, vertical velocity increases. Uh, it's an interesting case to watch in real time, and we also had a, um, we have the microwave profile radiometer, which shows you, this is the zero degree line here, for American clicks, and it shows you the warm tongue and then the cold, cold tongue here. So you know, let's see if this works. I can go to the website. We have a site which is available to the um, uh, aviation people in real time. Um, and it's available to external users by, the, by a password only. And down. So allowing you kind of really bulky. That shows you what the airports are like today. They're all clean, which indicates there are no issues today. Casting pretty easy. If you fund, for example, Toronto, it'll bring the situation chart, which is kind of boring today. It's all green. I reckon. And um, if you run any of these, you get additional information. I don't know whether it'll work over the. And you can all click on these barbs to get, uh, for example, work. 
example, the, the blue dot here indicates the crosswind. And these are the various models. Uh, we're adding here are the rapid refresh, the high resolution rapid refresh, and the reg regional model. Uh, so actually, it's not very easy to do when uh, you're doing it remotely. At any rate, this is the first uh, three hours, and then it goes out six hours for a forecast, um, and you get an idea of how well the models were doing um, in the past. And give you an idea. Uh, not going to work very well. This landline. Shows you the temperature with all of the models. Here we have the, the high res or higher resolution model, two and a half kilometer. The regional model, which is ten kilometer. The rapid refresh, which I believe is um, uh, three kilometers, and the high resolution rapid refresh and the rapid refresh. Observations from the observer in black, and then the sensor is in blue. So that gives you an idea. I'm going to get off of this. Cause it's too cumbersome. X, no, don't X that, George. No? No. Okay. X that. Go back. Just close your tab. Or minimize it. Sorry. Minimize the window. Minimize the window? Yes. Yeah. There you go. Any rate, the tour of the site for the, for the Canadians, I can do that, provide that for you. To an example of the fact that uh, conditions change rapidly, uh, just shows you visibility or runway visual range as a function of time, and then precipitation phase as a function of time from our various sensors. And the part of this graph was merely to show you the uh, the rapid changes that can occur at an airport um, and the need for high resolution observations and high resolution. Um, predictions. Some um, verifications that we did uh, for the um, winter of um, uh, 10 and the summer of 10, 2010 uh, for uh, Toronto. And this just shows you the mean absolute error for relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, the maximum wind speed or gust, and the crosswinds for the three runways. And, and um, interest here is the fact that the uh, relative humidity errors are quite high. This is climatology. You just took, took the climatological value for that hour and uh, used it. You would get that error. So, so what is the models are not getting be even beating climatology, which is pretty bad. Of humidity. For wind direction, also incredibly large errors in the middle error. You can see that in both the uh, wintertime and the summertime. The humidity error gives us problems when we're trying to um, predict um, fog. And um, the error is really critical because. And it tells us the most important thing for us to predict at an airport is wind and wind for change of runways. So I would want to say maybe those wind direction errors are caused because we're looking at all wind directions. And uh, so we looked at the errors for just winds greater than five knots, and there are still errors for both the winter and the summer for the regional model, the land model, and the rock. It's ours. And just an idea of the kind of errors that can occur and the value of persistence, this just should be the, the um, uh, vacation for 1st of December 09 to 31st of March 2010. It's, uh, uh, blue do these yellow dots are the climate average. They have to be the cl climate prediction. Is the uh, gem regional? Uh, red is the gem 
Oh, sorry, line is the damn regional and the, uh, and the green is the lamb. I don't know how I think that's reversed, but at any rate, it doesn't matter. And the blue is the ruck. The interesting thing about this is that this is persistence. If you said that OC, um, this value was going to persist, this kind of error you would get uh, going out into time, out to six hours. So in this particular case, persistence would beat all models and, and they in the climate average. And in this case here, maybe the uh, uh, after about five hours, um, uh, pers the model is doing better than persistence. It changes as a function of time of day. As you can see here, maybe it only takes a couple hours before the models take over from persistence. So that, um, this now for wind gusts, the same kind of thing. Uh, and um, in this case, the models were not doing very well at this time, these times of days, so at least the Canadian models. The U.S. rock model was doing much better. Um, but as you went into these times, uh, the, um, the models were doing better. So variation should be done at the time of day. Uh, now I'm going to show you a bit of our results from our casting and um, algorithm. The main idea behind now casting is that extrapolation of observations by whatever means you use can produce a better skill in numerical forecast models in the short term. So um, basically, um, this is the now cast. This is the NWP in terms of forecast lead time and information content. And, um, there is a certain crossover point the now casting uh, cannot beat the NWP models. I'll show you some results like that. So we're using two different now casting methods for predictions in the short term. One is called the adaptive blending of observations and models, or ABOM. It looks at the forecast at time, and it looks at the current observations, the change predicted by the observation trained, trend, and the change predicted by the model. And it, you train these coefficients based on the, the recent history, usually six to eight hours. And then we have an INTW system, which combines predictions from several NWP models, weighting them based on the past performance, usually six hours, and doing a bias correction. And it should snow B10. It's called SMO, SMO B10. It's used the three different models. For most of the predictions I'm going to show you, we use the, the GEM, the regional, and the uh, RUC model. And papers that show, describe the various techniques. Most of them are, are online now. You, you can access them. In 2012. So this shows you the NWP model with a minimum mean absolute error in CAN now for the winter and the summer periods for Pearson and Vancouver. Let's just look at Pearson. Um, you can see that. Uh, and then for temperature, for example, in the winter, the regional model produced produce the best minimum ab minimum absolute error, whereas in the summertime, the rock model did. Um, the, what the way message from this is that different models do better at different locations and for different parameters. And that are the values of the uh, INTW system because it uh, basically checks the accuracy of all the different models and produces a, a forecast. INTW for the same kind of comparison produced the best forecast for all these variables. The time model to beat persistence is given in this chart. So, for example, LAM for um, Toronto uh, for temperature, it uh, took six hours before LAM beat persistence. And, uh, for the INTW, which Used both the LAM, the regional, and the rock. It took and a half hours before it beat persistence. Uh, and um, the, the top chart is for the winter, the bottom chart is for the summer. And you can see, if you look at this, basically the integrated system, uh, NowCast system, uh, was being the models in terms of when the, when it reached the crossover point for persistence. And this shows you the ABOM technique. 
similar kind of things. This is temperature for Toronto, uh, and this shows you the, the, um, the, the LAM error. It turns average everything over all the time time periods, so you get to end up with a straight line. Believe me, it's counterintuitive, but you do. And this is the error for the regional. In this case, the regional model is doing better than the LAM. This black line is persistence. What would happen if you just used persistence? And then um, the A bomb, which is using either the LAM or the regional model, is doing better than persistence. So that's one of our rules of thumb. The, the sneak is not very good unless it's beating persistence. And for relative humidity, which has a large error, as you can see, uh, up to 10 percent, um, uh, persists here is a better indicator, and of course the A-bomb technique is doing better overall than uh, persistence. I'll show you some, categor some um, categorical forecasts. We subdivided the, um, uh, some of the variables into various categories based on our thresholds, and we need to do that for things like visibility and ceiling, so I'm going to concentrate on those. And, um, the problem, of course, with visibility is you can get uh, unlimited visibility, and for ceiling you can get unlimited uh, ceilings, and those come great uh, pain. You try to uh, put them into a numerical scheme, so that's why we're doing these by these categories. Um, calculate a high key skill score, which on these categories, which is this complicated-looking equation here. And what the high key skill score does, it tells you what the what was the accuracy of the forecast in predicting the correct category relative to that of random chance? So there's no skill and one is perfect, a perfect skill. I'm also going to show you the ACC scores, or the accuracy score. And that is the what a fraction of the forecasts that were in the correct category. Again, there's no skill, one is perfect skill score. So this shows you the Winter and the summer for ceiling, precipitation rate, visibility. But there, we have run two visibility schemes. One is uh, uh, produced by um, Gully and Milbrandt, and one is produced by Budal and Isaac. There are different papers, so we're evaluating them both. And we're using the RUC scheme, which is also a different scheme. Uh, and then, of course, frost winds, precipitation type, and so forth. I'm just going to concentrate on the ceiling and the visibility. You can see that the top number is the HSS score and the bottom number is the ACC score. And these are numbers. Um, they're showing that we there's a there's room for improvement. Remember, one is a perfect score and zero is no skill. Um, so you can look at these numbers and say maybe they're not that great. Uh, the um, individual cases, they look pretty good. And one of the things we had, what happens if you relax the uh, the time of the score? For example, we were insisting that the visibility occur exactly when the when the observation happened, and so we said, well, what was the minimum visibility within an hour um, uh, of the forecast? And um, you don't get uh, a great improvement by doing that. So um, I didn't that was a problem. Sorry. Um, we're making progress to, f to forecast aviation-related variables using numerical model output and NALCAST schemes. We, al we already have a system which uses climatology, which is called WIN3, and describe that. Win3 system does uh, ceiling and visibility with a special um, intelligence type technique. Uh, so it uses NWP, it uses the um, climatology, and it uses the uh, uh, existing um, uh, observation. Our predictions are poor, they barely beat climatology, and that impacts our visibility forecasts. Our visibility forecasts are poor from a statistical point of view. But um, I think if you look at individual cases, you get a better impression from them. The base forecast 
show some skill, but they could be improved with better model resolution in the boundary layer. And that's coming, at least for the Canadian models, in this fall. Um, the wind direction is either poorly forecast or measured, and I believe it's poorly forecast. I don't have a good reason for that. Um, and difficulties in measuring parameters like precipitation amount and type, which I haven't, didn't have time to go into. Well, statistical scores do not show the complete story. We need to need an emphasis on high impact events. And um, uh, I go through that because I don't have time to go through some case studies. The selection of the model point to best represent the site is a critical process, and uh, that was really critical for Vancouver because it's near a big water mass. It's right on the water. And if you pick a point which is just uh, over the water, just away from the site, you can get a quite different results. Um, the weather changes rapidly, especially in complex terrain, like, like a land-water interface. It's necessary to get good measurements of time resolutions at least 1 to 15 minutes. And, um, and we try to get measurements at 1 minute resolution. Another rapidly changing nature of weather um, uh, the weather forecast must also be given at a high time resolution. Um, that's one of the, the weaknesses of the task. They tend to see things over a long time. Um, verification of mesoscale forecasts and nowcast must be done with the appropriate type of data, and that means data not just collected on an hourly basis. And schemes which blend NWP models and observations at a site outperform in individual NWP models and persistence at one to two hours. Hopefully I showed you that. We're currently using products to develop a first guess TAF. Uh, that TAF, first guess TAF is being tested at the aviation weather centers now. It's the, uh, using the algorithms we've developed for the CAN now system. That's why I say we've sort of gone beyond the now casting system and for the time we're looking at uh, 24, 36 hours. Um, and last week, at a recent intensive review period, where we had forecasters and the researchers working together, um, first of all, a lot of positive results come out in terms of forecasting VFR conditions. Uh, for example, maybe 40% of the, at least 30 of last week, 40% of the forecasts were VFR. And um, it looked like the, the uh, first graph could have been used for those uh, they're being used. This was just being a test, of course. The, um, the first guess could have been used to, to produce those VFR forecasts. Um, the algorithms definitely need some improvement. For example, low cloud is often predicted in the Arctic under cold conditions when skies are clear. Uh, we're discussing that with our colleagues in Montreal. Where that happens. It's a really perplexing issue for us. And there are many issues with re precipitation type that uh, we need for the first guest task. Making progress and um, uh, things are moving forward. That's it. I think I'm in it, right? right? Yep. Any questions for George? Hey, George. All right, I'm going to pull up the last presentation, and I apologize again that we're a little bit over time. So if you have to leave now, I, I may recommend that you do it, um, just so we avoid uh, beeps during uh, Chris's presentation. I'm just going to get that started.